Great to have talented people here for when Wade is out of town. Y'all wouldn't want me leading the music. That's all I could say. Well, good morning. Y'all look good today. Is it the cooler weather? You're kind of brightening up a little bit? Is that what it is? And if I had my camera with me, I'd take a selfie with y'all, but I don't have one. So uh, we've got to move fast this morning. Uh, I picked a text of scripture. I had no idea what's as long as it is. And I'm not going to attempt to cover it all, but it's important, so I do want to hit the highlights. And we're going to be in John chapter 6 today, uh, verses 22 through 71. Now, I'm not going to read all those. We're going to read 22 through 40 in just a minute. It's about Jesus' statement where he says, I am the bread of life. And I want to ask you something just to get started, to get you kind of on the same mind track, uh, track of mind that everyone else was when they were going through this passage in the first century. And I want to ask you, if you were trying to identify yourself to someone who did not know you, and they gave you seven statements to do that, what would those seven statements be about yourself? Think about it for a minute. What would they be? I think this could be healthy to reflect like this, to have the self-inspection like this. Probably give them your name. Maybe you talk about your spouse, family members, occupation, maybe hometown, education, passions, etc., things like that. If you wanted to be really transparent and honest with people, you'd probably talk about your struggles, maybe even delve into your sins a little bit. Uh, but it's a little bit different for Jesus. He's not sinful. sinful. And it's, he's so, the topic is so broad, I don't, I'm not even sure where I would begin if I was trying to do this for Jesus. But fortunately, uh, the Gospel of John does this for us. In the Gospel of John, the Apostle does something very similar to this in order to reveal Jesus to us. Uh, John's purpose for writing his gospel, as he explicitly states in his book, is to present Jesus as the Son of God so that people can believe in him and be saved. In fact, verse uh, 30 and 31 of chapter 20 says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these things have been written to you so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that by believing you may have faith in his name. That was why he wrote the Gospel of John, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And in order to achieve that purpose, John actually arranges his Gospel around the signs and the miracles that demonstrate that Jesus is indeed the Son of God. And he also arranges it around seven statements made by Jesus himself about himself that will also help prove this point. And those statements are often referred to as the seven I am statements. These, seven, these are seven statements made by Jesus about himself. And they go a long way toward revealing his true identity to the world. Those statements are accompanied by the teaching of Jesus, which separates John's gospel from some of the others, which focus just on the event. John focuses on the meaning for the event as well. And those statements are as follows. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life and I am the true vine. Now, last week, uh, I challenged you to wait upon the Lord, regardless of what the situation of your life at that time, I I encouraged you to wait upon the Lord, which meant I wanted you to trust in Him. I wanted you to place your hope in Him, all of your hope in Him. I wanted you to anxiously anticipate His working on your behalf, even if it didn't happen in this lifetime. I wanted you to anticipate his coming and prepare for it in a way so that you would live as though it was about to happen at any moment. And if you're going to do that, if you're going to live by faith in this manner, there's something that you have to do. If you're going to place this much faith in someone or something, don't you think that you need a great understanding of who that person is? That's why John wrote this book. He wants us to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and by believing, gain eternal life. But he doesn't want, it to do, want us 
to do that out of ignorance. He wants us to do from a point of being informed and of knowing the truth. I don't know about you, but it genuinely bothers me when there are political leaders that refuse to answer questions or refuse to explain their positions and tell us why it's good for us. If it is really good for us, you would think they would want to convince us that it's really good for us. If it really is the best thing for our country, you would think that they would want to answer questions so that we would be confident in trusting in their leadership. And that's exactly what John and Jesus are doing right here. They are trying to convince us, to persuade us, that Jesus Christ is indeed worthy of our trust, of our faith, and of our hope. And over the next two months, we're actually going to take six more weeks after this week to dive into these seven statements so that we can get to know Jesus better because we desire that you trust him fully and that you wait upon him. Let me give you a little background uh, about the Gospel of John. The first five chapters of John's Gospel, uh, prior to chapter 6, where we're going to be today, have dealt with, first of all, the incarnation. In John 1, 1 through 18, we had that famous passage that begins, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. And this is... Uh, talking about the incarnation of the Son of God, where the Word became flesh and He dwelt among us and we beheld His glory as of the only begotten of the Son of God. Okay, That's what He's doing there. He's, he's talking about the incarnation. And then immediately in chapter 1, verse 19, through the end of chapter 4, He talks about the presentation of the, of the Son of God. Okay, so beginning with John the Baptist and preceding throughout uh, the first five chapters, we see this story begin to unfold as person after person begins to present Jesus to us. In chapter 2, uh, well, first of all, it's John the Baptist. In chapter 2, uh, Jesus ch cleanses the temple and he turns the water into wine at the wedding at Cana. In chapter 3, we see his encounter with Nicodemus uh, as he as he came to visit Jesus at night. And at the end of chapter 3, we see John the Baptist again coming and bearing testimony. In chapter 4, Jesus meets the woman at the well in Samaria. In 5, he heals the man uh, by the pool of Bethesda on the Sabbath. And all through this, Jesus revealing bit by bit, step by step, who he is and why he should be trusted for our salvation. And that's where we pick it up in chapter 6. As we start chapter 6 in verse 1, Jesus has just pulled off an amazing miracle. He's been preaching and performing signs and wonders throughout the area of Judea. He then moves to the region of Galilee, around the Sea of Galilee. And one afternoon, as was the habit and the practice, day by day he would preach he would perform signs, and the crowd would come to see him, and they would be amazed. And as he preached and moved on to another city, the crowds would follow him there, and it would increasingly grow and grow. And on this afternoon, he was uh, in the area near Tiberias, and he's once again preaching, and he's about to perform a miracle. And as the crowds are approaching them, and it's getting late in the afternoon, Jesus turns to his disciples, and he says, How should we go about feeding all these people? And the best solution that his disciples could come up with was a little boy who had five small loaves of bread and two fish. Not much. No problem. Jesus prays. He blesses the food. He breaks it, and he has his disciples distribute it. The text of the Scripture says that there were 5,000 men there that day, which means there could easily be ten to 20,000 people there if you counted women and children as well. So let me put this in perspective, okay? Jesus takes out five loaves of bread and two fish, and he feeds a town the size of Claremore with what the equivalent of a couple of filet of fish sandwiches from McDonald's. That's what he did. And three of them didn't have fish in them. <laughs> That's impressive. That's impressive. Well, that afternoon... Uh, as the sun went down, again, the crowds are pressing on them. Jesus encourages his disciples to get in a boat to cross the sea and head toward Capernaum. As they do that, they would later encounter strong winds. And you see that in, verses eight, in verse 18. And they're about three or four miles out to sea when they're struggling against these winds, and there's a storm brewing, and Jesus walks upon water to meet them. The Scripture says that he calmed their fears by calming the seas. 
And then once he did that, immediately they were at their destination. And I bring this up even though it has nothing really to do with our message today other than the fact that last week I said sometimes we face challenges and struggles in our life because we disobey God. But this passage shows us that sometimes we face struggles and challenges in our life because we obey God. And we need to keep that in mind. Second thing, I want to point out that Jesus does stuff that only God can do. He's the only one that could do these things. And this is where we are when we come across the teaching of Jesus that we're going to study today. So if you would, stand with me in honor of the reading of God's Word. And we're going to be in John chapter 6, and we're going to read verses 22 through 40. John 6, 22 through 40. It says, On the next day the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there, and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they, got themselves, they themselves got into boats and went to Capernaum seeking Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? And Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. But for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you, for on him God the Father has set his seal. And then they said to him, What must we do to be doing the works of God? And Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. And so they said to him, Then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate manna in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. And Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down for heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of the Father, of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life and will raise him up on that last day. Father, I pray that as we dive into these scriptures today, that we will discover the truth about Jesus and discover his real identity. Father, I pray that as John desired by putting the pen to paper and writing down this gospel, that we would believe that Jesus is indeed the Son of God, the Christ, the Messiah, and that by believing in him, we would experience life to the fullest and eternal life. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. When I thought it would be a good idea to do the I am statements, I'd forgotten how long some of them were. I mentioned to you that they were pretty lengthy. Um, this passage actually goes through uh, verse 71. It's 50 verses long. And obviously you can't hit all of the key points in that. I want to encourage you, take the highlights that I present to you today, go home, reflect on what we've talked about, and then dig deeper into the details. Uh, the most Beautiful parts and the best parts of this scripture are in the details, and I challenge you to do that. So here's what I'm going to do. I started studying this passage and looking for natural breaks in the text. And the way that I saw it dividing was that Jesus is a, beginning a conversation with this crowd that had followed him to his new location in Capernaum. And as he's preaching to them, it seems like his conversation progresses from that of talking to the crowds in general to that of discussing... A, serious 
theological and religious matters with the Jews that were present in the crowd till ultimately where he's struggling, dealing with some of the struggles that his very own disciples are having with the message that he dealt with. So I'm going to look at his message to each of those three areas, try to hit the highlights there, you know, form a highlight reel for you to take home with you, and then we'll, we'll uh, talk about those things and just kind of leave it at that for today. Uh, this passage begins, uh, begins as a conversation, but it progresses to the point where it's actually a sermon. And uh, because of that, my message today is going to look more like a Bible study than a sermon. And the reason that is, John MacArthur once said that you don't preach a sermon on a sermon. You teach a sermon. You explain a sermon. You help people understand what the sermon was about. And to make this you know, doubly complicated... This sermon is also a sermon about a metaphor. You don't look for a metaphor to explain a metaphor. You just explain the metaphor. So we have that that we're wrestling with today, and that's what I'm going to try to do. So bear with me as we spend the next few minutes uh, talking about this sermon and this metaphor that Jesus had given to us. In verses 22 through 40, the passage we just read, Jesus is talking to the crowds, and he begins by addressing them. And I want you to realize that the crowds consisted of people from the other side of the lake that had seen Jesus perform the miracle feeding just the day before. And like I said, it's made up of Jews, it's made up of Gentiles, and it's made up of disciples of Jesus Christ. However, while these are different groups, we can also see that they have, can div be divided in a different way. Within this group and in, within each group, there are people that would be considered religious people. These are people like the Jews who mostly do not believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. But there's also non-religious people, which is primarily Gentiles, who mostly do not know what God's Word teaches about the Messiah, and they don't really care. And so we're going to be addressing the, these passages from that as well. And it's good to keep in mind that Jesus is dealing with both religious and irreligious people, people that have a knowledge of this background and people that don't have it and don't care. And that will be important because although they are different, there's also a lot of similarities. And it's actually the, the similarities that Jesus focuses on here. The two groups have a couple things in common um, that... Jesus takes this opportunity to address. The first is that they're seeking Jesus. They're seeking Jesus. This is actually the good news. Uh, the ver the verse 24 says that, So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, and you'll remember he had just performed the feeding of the 500, it was getting late, the crowds again were pressing on him, he put his disciples in a boat and sent them to the other side of the river, but he stayed there. The crowd saw that, but they went to look for him, and they couldn't find him because he had walked out on the sea, joined the disciples in the middle of the sea, and then immediately was transported to the other side of the sea. So that's what they're struggling with. They're seeking Jesus, but they haven't been able to find him. But the Scripture says they are seeking him from a position of unbelief, and that's where I'm going to dwell on with this first point about Jesus talking to the crowds. They are seeking Jesus for the wrong reasons, and all of these reasons display that they don't believe in God rather than that they do. Verse 24, they ask Jesus, Rabbi, when did you get here? Verses 25 and 26, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, you're seeking me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. They aren't seeking Jesus because they saw the miracle that he did and said, this miracle displays the fact that there's something special about this man. Like when we were studying holiness, that this man is other than what we are. That he is above us. He is higher than us. He must be God or he must be the Son of God. I'm going to seek him and discover if that's true. That's not the perspective that they're coming from. And Jesus says that in verses 25 and 26. And he adds, but you're seeking me because you ate your fill of the loaves. They saw the miracle the day before. It was amazing. And now they want another one. In fact, I think that there may be a few that are seeking him from pure motives, but they're all a very small minority. The majority of them want to see another miracle. They want to be fed again. And we see the characteristics of unbelief here in their responses to Jesus. In verse 26, we see that unbelief is driven by their flesh and not by the Spirit. Verse 26 says, Truly, truly, I say to you, you're seeking me not because you saw the signs, but because, because you ate your fill of the loaves. Verse 27 says that un, shows us that un, unbelief lives for the things of this world. He says, do not work for food that perishes, 
but for the food that endures through eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him the Father has set his seal. And think about that for a minute. Most of us are probably like that, if we were to be honest with ourselves. If we look at the way we carry out our lives, if we look at the way that we invest our time, if we look at the way that we invest all of the resources that are disposable, many of us must say that at least to some small degree, I am investing way too much into gaining the things of this world, which are those things that will spoil, rather than investing them into the things of the kingdom of heaven, which are eternal, which will not spoil. Okay? That's the problem that Jesus is pointing out with unbelief. They want God, but they want him especially if it will help, him, help them in their career. Their true motives are rooted in power, rooted in prestige, rooted in possessions. It's rooted in uh, almost a form of hedonism where they are seeking to find pleasure for themselves from the things of this world rather than to find it in God. And I don't know if you've ever thought about that. God wants to be a lot of things in our life, but did you know he wants to be your source of pleasure as well? He wants to be your source of fulfillment. He wants to be the number one place that you go when you're looking uh, for pleasure in this world. That's what's at the very heart of Jesus saying that he is the bread of life. Verse 28 tells us that, that what was, must we do to do the works of God? This shows us that unbelief trusts in themselves and it trusts in their works. This is the mark of a true religionist, a religionist. And it kind of puts on display that contrast between those who come to God through religion and those who come to God through relationship. And it's a key distinction that we need to make. Uh, the, the mark of a religionist or someone who is purely religious like the Jews in this context, he is self-righteous. He trusts in his own works. He thinks that he'll be made right with God through his own efforts. And this is the mark also of every single world religion throughout the world. You can group the religions of the world into two categories, Christianity and every other one. And Christianity says you come to good work, you come to salvation for your sins through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And every other religion says that you develop righteousness by yourself and therefore come into the kingdom of God through your own works. And it was my testimony that for 25 years I sought to be pleasing to God so that I could develop a righteousness in myself that would be sufficient to get me into the kingdom of God. And I could have worked for 25,000 years and never gotten to that point where I achieved that. Verse 30 says, So they said to him, Well, what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What works do you perform? Unbelief demands a sign from God, even when they've already had one. Uh, I think as I'm looking at this, and I, I always try to read something like this, and maybe it's healthy, maybe it's not, but I like to say, what is the tone of this conversation that's going on here? And I kind of came to the conclusion after reading this over and over again that they're messing with Jesus here. They're kind of playing games with him. Uh, they're trying to manipulate him into doing another miracle. You know, they saw what he did the day before. They want to see it again. And uh, for them, it's just food and entertainment. I read somewhere in the last couple of days that in the Roman Empire, when it was at its peak, that they would provide 69 days per year of public entertainment through the circuses and through free food that was provided just to keep the people under control. They figured it was, it was easier to entertain the people and to feed them than it was to fight them or have to arrest them. And for a large part of that, it proved successful. And I think that this is the mindset that these people have. I don't really care if you control me. I don't really care if these things keep me in bondage, as long as I'm happy, as long as I have pleasure. And uh, so in one form or another, unbelief in these people just wants to get something from him. Christians and churches do that in ways too today. This verse also says that unbelief is never satisfied. You know, it always needs one more miracle, one more piece of evidence, one more freebie from Jesus, you know, one more good activity in his life versus one more trial. And it's like we keep scoring. If Jesus is performing sufficiently in their mind, then maybe they'll put their trust in him. But if he's not living up to their hopes and expectations, they won't do it. This is the sign of unbelief. Verse 31 says... Our fathers ate man in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. And this shows that unbelief misunderstands Scripture and wrongly applies it to their life. 
What happened, what's happening here is this is actually a continuation of the previous statement, and they're actually arguing with God. Uh, that's driven by the doubts that they have toward him, even when the truth is obvious, okay? Jesus has just fed the city of Claremore with, 20, <laughs> with, with two filet of fish sandwiches and a few empty buns, and they're not satisfied. They're still not convinced, and that's the sign of unbelief. Unbelief is never convinced, and all of you probably know people that you've been praying that will come to the Lord, and you've shared with them time and time again, and you've invited them to things at church, and you've introduced them to people that are effective soul winners. And time and time again, they hear the best presentations of truth, the best evidence that Jesus is the Son of God and He's the Savior of all men, and they refuse to come to Him because they just haven't seen enough. I need one more miracle. I need one more explanation. I need one more piece of power from the Scripture of God. And they're never satisfied with it. And I kind of see the tone here. Sure, you fed 10,000 with five loaves and two fish. Do it again if you're the real deal. Sure, you fed Claire more with filet of fish sandwiches. That's nothing. Moses fed manna to the entire nation of Israel. He did it six days a week for 40 years. Top that, Mr. Big Shot. That's what they're saying. They're mocking him. But it's interesting, I love Jesus to come back. I went to my Blue Letter Bible app. If you don't have it, get it. It's really a handy tool. It's free. And I searched manna in the New Testament. And there were three verses that popped up from John chapter 6. The first one is verse 31, which we just read. And it's the taunt from the Jews in the crowd that says, Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. For as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And he's again taunting them. What can you do for me? Verse 49, Jesus replied, your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, and they died. Whoa. I'd say touche and mic drop, except there's one more. Verse 58, Jesus identifies the true manna. He says, this is the bread that comes down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna, and they died. But whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Wow. That's the point that Jesus wants us to get today, that he is the true bread of life that has come down from heaven. The man in the wilderness was a picture of the true belief from heaven, uh, of the true bread, I'm sorry, from heaven that would come, and that's Jesus Christ. And the nation of Israelite, Israel ate this bread for 40 years, and they did it day after day after day so that when the true bread arrived on the scene, they would recognize it because they had eaten the type for 40 years, but they missed it. They missed the point. Verses 32 through 36, it says, Unbelief misses God's greatest blessing, the one that will fulfill their greatest needs even when he's standing right in front of them. Jesus immediately begins correcting their understanding about the manna that they received from Moses. Verse 33, he says, The bread of God, he, okay, it's not a thing, it's a person. He is a person. Also in verse 33, The bread of God comes down from heaven, and it doesn't just fall from the sky like the manna did. Also in 33, the bread of God gives life to the world, and your ancestors all died. True bread descends from above. Now Jesus is teaching some good, solid theology here to them. He's addressing some of the key issues of our faith. The bread of God is not from this world. He is a person. He comes from heaven. Jesus is addressing his origin, his eternal nature, and his redemptive purposes as the bread of life. He's getting into the meat of our faith. And that's what he's trying to get them to see. I'm not talking about a piece of bread that fell from the sky onto the ground so that you could be fed. Because it doesn't really matter. You're just going to be hungry again the next day. I'm talking to you about the Son of God who descended from the highest heaven and who has come to earth to save you from your sins. And I am standing right here in front of you, and you do not even recognize me. And there is unbelief in the churches of America today that is every bit as bad. The crowd, with the exception of a few who believed, missed this point. I was thinking about this. I'm speaking to individuals, a group of individuals who form a crowd today. And this is a question that's purely hypothetical, but I want to ask you this. Why are you here? Wow, 
Why are you here? I was thinking of some of the reasons that I know that people have come in the past. I know some of these reasons are reasons that I've come to church in the past. Are you here so that you can benefit here in a worldly way? That you can have bread from heaven that will spoil? You know, maybe you can make some business contacts. Perhaps you can meet some new clients here. Maybe you can make a good impression on others and boost your reputation in the community. You know, maybe you're here mainly to please your spouse. A lot of men do that. A lot of women do it too, I guess. Are you hoping that the kids will benefit from the ministries here at the church? You know, you see how it could help them. You see how it could be beneficial to them. Are you just wanting to be around others? Are you hoping you'll find some new friends, maybe find a date for the weekend if you're single? You hoping to earn favor with God? Are you trying to rack up some points with the man upstairs? Are you hoping to tip the scale in favor of your good deeds versus your bad day, deeds when God puts them on the scales of justice? That's what, that was me for a couple of decades. Are you here to meet the living God? To have your sins forgiven? To restore your relationship with Him? To immerse yourself in the worship of His Son, Jesus Christ? I think it's interesting that bread is a solution for hunger. Would you like to have your greatest hunger met? You see, the need to restore damage done by your sins against the holy God, the need to receive forgiveness and to be cleansed from your sin and the guilt that comes with it, the need to be spiritually alive is your greatest need. And there's been philosophers of the past who have described the fact that there was a, there was a hole in the heart of man who was shaped exactly like Jesus Christ. He is the perfect solution to fulfilling your greatest need because your greatest need is not physical and of this world, but your greatest need is spiritual and can only be answered through God himself. That's Jesus' message to the crowd. Next, he goes to the Jews. And the lines are kind of blurred here. Jesus begins by talking to the crowd, and then it's obviously clear that one of the questions that comes from the crowd is from a Jew because he asks about our ancestors who was in the wilderness. He's talking about the Jews. And it actually transgresses to the point where in, I think, verse 41, Jesus is directly addressing the grumblings of the Jewish people that are there in the crowd. Uh, so that's kind of where we get, it, and that's where we are. The Jews were grumbling because they understood what Jesus was saying. Did you know that? It wasn't that they didn't understand it. They're grumbling because they did understand it. And they don't like it. So let's back up a little and make sure you understand what he's saying. I'm going to go back to the very beginning of this and talk about the fact that Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Uh, the Jews didn't like this because they understood what he, that Jesus was equating himself with God as he said that. And you're saying, really, by saying he's the bread of life, he's equating himself with God? Well, let's think about this for a minute. Bread is very common, okay? Bread is for everybody. All people can relate to this term. Uh, rich and poor all eat bread, right? Men and women eat bread. Fat kids, skinny kids, kids that climb on rocks all eat bread, right? Just like Oscar Mayer hot dogs. They all eat it. In fact, it's not just talking about bread here. It's talking about food in general. In fact, he's using it as a synonym for food. Just like you say, well, I need to get a roof over my head. You're not saying I just need a roof, but I don't need floors and walls and doors and household fixtures. Roof applies to everything. I need housing. I need a place to stay. Well, in the very same way, he's saying uh, that bread is the food we need, the nourishment for our bodies and soul. Every single one of us needs it. Okay? We need to eat bread daily. In fact, the Lord's Prayer, Jesus says, give us this day our daily bread. He's not just saying... Just give me bread. Don't give me meat. Don't give me vegetables. Don't give me stuff to drink. Just give me bread. No, he's saying, give me the food that I need to sustain my body through the day. Bread is also necessary for life. If we don't have bread, we're in trouble. You know, if we don't have bread, there's probably severe issues somewhere along the line in the food chain. Have you ever thought about this? Uh, bread is made from grain. There's a lot of other things that are made from grain as well. Uh, so if we don't have bread, there's other things that we'll be lacking in our lives as well. And you also realize that there's a lot of the animals that we consume as food that feed off of grain as well. So if they don't have it, they don't have food, so we don't have those animals, or at least we have, or at least we have skinny animals, and it's not nearly as tasty. So that's a problem. 
And if there's no grain, then other crops are probably scarce too, okay? If we don't have bread, the most basic of foods, then we have an issue. Third, bread satisfies hunger. It meets a need and it brings relief, but it's only temporary. Fourth, bread nourishes us. It provides us with energy, with strength, with vitality. We would die without bread. It literally is life for us. We have to have it in order to survive. And bread is a source of life. So Jesus is implying in a spiritual sense that all of these things are true and that all of these things are being said about him. Did you catch that? He's common. He's there offering himself to every man. He's necessary for life. He satisfies hunger. He nourishes us. He's a source of life. You cannot live without me is what he's saying. And people are thinking, well, that would only be true of God. And the Jesus is going, that's my point exactly. It would only be true of God. And I am his son of the very same nature as he. But there's more. It's not just what Jesus said. It's the way that he said it as well. Look at the structure of this sentence in Greek. Uh, I listened to a video from, by R.C. Sproul on this. It was a short 15-minute video. Super great explanation. He says that usually in, the Greek, in Greek, the phrase I am is translated ego, which is like ego, like the waffle. You know what I'm talking about? Frozen, stick it in the toaster, delicious stuff emerges. Okay? He's talking like that. But there's another way to translate uh, this word I am. And that is the Greek word ami, E-I-M-I. So we have two different ways, E-G-O and E-I-M-E, ego and me. Okay? And what is interesting is Jesus was saying, I am the bread of life. He said, didn't say ego. He didn't say ami. He said ego ami, which literally would be translated, I am, I am the bread of life. And Sproul points out that in this particular Greek construction, which is extremely rare, when it is presented in this form, it actually reverses the order of the sentence. So that what you're saying is not, I am, I am the bread of life, but you're, what you're saying, the bread of life, I am, I am. And that's interesting because one of the other places that we find this particular expression of Jesus of being used about someone or something in the scriptures is in uh, the book of Exodus, where in chapter 3, where Moses is standing before the burning bush in the wilderness. And in, in verses 13 and 14, it says, Suppose I go to the, ilder, the wilderness and say to them, This is Moses talking to God. The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What's the name of this God who sent you? Then what shall I tell them? In verse 14, God said to Moses, I am who I am. And the phrase that he used was ego ami in the Septuagint. You're saying it's written in Hebrew. That's right. You're pretty, pretty smart. But there was a group of scholars, 70 of them got together, and they penned a Greek translation of the Old Testament called the Septuagint, the 70, because there were 70 of them working on it. And as they did this, they used this expression that Jesus is using right here, to say, I am, I am is my name. So Jesus is saying, the bread of life is the name that Moses, that God was give, gave to Moses to say to Pharaoh and to the people of Israel when they ask him who sent me. It is making a divine proclamation. So when Jesus says, the bread of life, I am, I am, he is saying, I am God, I am his son, I am the preexistent one, I am sent from heaven. He's making it clear to him that they are God. And the Jewish people did not like this. He's claiming to be God himself. Second reason they didn't like it was the Jews didn't like this because they understood that as God, Jesus was saying that he and the Father were sovereign in the process of salvation. And the Jews didn't like that. They had their own system set up. They had created it from the law of God. Years of tradition, thousands of years of tradition had been built up, and they had this system where through their strict adherence, rigid adherence to the law of God, they could prove to themselves that they were worthy of the kingdom of God. And God is saying, that's not it. You don't have control over it. It's not of the flesh. It's of the spirit. It's of me. Something that still infuriates people today, did you know that? When God says that I am sovereign over the process of salvation, there's a lot of people that get angry about that. I understand the frustration that it creates, but it's not a reason to get upset. Remember, 
Jesus has already said that the bread of life is food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. And the crowd asked him, what, what must we do to be doing the word of life, God? And in John 6, 28, what did he say? You must do, the work of God is that you must believe in him who has sent. Okay? Simplification of that, believe in Jesus Christ and you will be saved. John 6, 47. The point is that I'm trying to make is that salvation has always come by grace through faith. Always. It has always come when we, through believing in Jesus Christ, place our trust in Him. It has always meant an active trust in God that brings about repentance from sin. So you got it? Okay? The reason I'm saying this, I'm clarifying, this is probably what 90% of the Christians in here, if not 100% of the Christians in this room, would agree with me. Okay? It is that no one can come to me unless the, I'm sorry, is that uh, Jesus comes to Christ, that everyone who comes to Christ chooses to surrender his or her life to Christ, to repent from their sin, and to follow Christ in joyful obedience. No exception. You got that? Salvation always comes by grace through faith, but when somebody chooses to follow after God. I'm not going to argue that that's wrong, okay, because the Scripture teaches that. But it also teaches that God is sovereign in the process of salvation. And I, I point that out, and I start with the fact that we are saved by grace through faith, through a decision to follow Christ. And people often ask Charles Haddon Spurgeon about this very thing, and they said, they would ask them, well, Dr. Spurgeon, how is it that you reconcile uh, salvation by grace through faith and predestination and election? And he says, well, I don't. There's no need to reconcile, friends. And that's what I want you to understand, that these two schools of thought are actually two sides of the same coin. They're working in cooperation with each other to bring about the salvation of mankind. Uh, look at what it says here. Verse 37a says, All that the Father gives to me, this is saying all that the Father gives to Jesus, the Son, will come to me in terms of salvation. Okay, So the process of salvation begins when God presents His gift to the Son in loyal followers of Him. Okay, that's when it begins. 37b says, whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Okay, talking a little bit there about security of believer. Verse 38, for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. So Jesus is beginning to unfold this picture that Father and Son and Holy Spirit are working in perfect cooperation with one another. And it's all the sovereign work of the triune God working on our behalf. Verse 39 says, And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose nothing of all that he has given me, but I will raise it up on the last day. Again, if we have been given by the Father to the Son, then we do not have to worry about losing our salvation. It is secure forever because God and Christ are holding on to it for us. Verse 45 says, And it is written in the prophets that they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. And this is actually this quote where it says, uh, and they will all be taught from God, is actually a quote that is cited directly from Isaiah 54, 13. And it's referring, referring to a time during the millennial kingdom. And Isaiah is talking about the fact that every single individual that is there in the, in the millennial kingdom will have a perfect understanding of who he is because they will be taught by God himself. And that's what he's referring to here, that everybody that comes to faith in Christ in this age in the very same way will come because they have been taught by God, that, that, he will, that God will personally take responsibility of revealing himself to them so that they can have the faith that is necessary in order to trust in him. And verse 47 says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. It goes full circle again begins with the sovereign choice of God. He calls us to Him through the process of election. He, he, he calls us and compels us to come to Him. And ultimately, we place our faith in Him by choosing to follow after God, by believing in Him. I want you to note, the sovereignty of God and faith and repentance go hand in hand. We all come to God by exercising faith, but we are also chosen, taught, drawn, kept, and raised by God. 
I think it's interesting. This is difficult, and I think one of the reasons a lot of people struggle this is they encounter it early on in their faith before they're ready to actually grasp some of these things. Uh, Spurgeon actually had one of my favorite quotes about this topic when he says, it's important that we first graduate from the grammar school of faith and repentance before enrolling in the university of predestination and election. It does take some time walking with God. It does take some time getting a grasp of the entire picture of the Word of God before you can really start to get a handle of some of these things. Because as you see from this passage of Scripture, these teaching in the Old in the New Testament find their roots and their strength from the Old Testament. And until you fully grasp what Jesus is teaching in the Old Testament, it's very difficult sometimes to fully understand what he's trying to reveal to us in the New. I might actually make this on time. One last section. And this is where Jesus is talking to the disciples. I'm just going to read chapter, verses 60 and 61. It says, When many of his disciples heard it, they said, This is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, Do, not take, do you take offense at this? So, just as the Jews took offense at it, even Jesus' very own disciple had heard this entire discussion and the discourse that followed it, the explanation of some of the meaning that was behind the sign of the feeding of the 5,000 and Jesus' declaration to be the bread of life, and they're struggling with what he's saying too. Now, when you all go through disciples' boot camp here, and we te teach you some very basic ways to approach the Scripture. There's a set of questions that we ask you to ask. We've actually used several of them here. We're searching for truth here, and truth is a person. And we say, first of all, ask yourself, what's the main truth? What's the main thing that he's trying to teach you? And we've said that John, from the very beginning, was trying to teach us that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that by believing in him, you can have eternal life. And as a... As a reinforcement and a support truth of all of this jesus is saying i am the bread of life i can fulfill that spiritual need so you'll never hunger or thirst again i can sustain you for all eternity and with spiritual life that's the main truth that he's trying to teach here the divine truth is what is he teaching us about god well the main one of the main things is that that the that the man the the son of god is the bread of life that descends from heaven that he was in the beginning with God in heaven, that all things were created by him, that his origins are there. The scripture says that he began there, that he comes to earth with a purpose and he will ultimately return there. Just think about the purpose that you would have in your life if you were certain about your roots and where you came from and you knew for certain why you had been sent here and you also knew for certain where you were going to end up in the world. A lot of the stress that we incur on a daily basis would be taken care of if we had a grasp of that. And Jesus is saying, I know that about myself. But the Jews didn't like that. Okay? And then ultimately, you know, what's the hard truth? And that's what his discussion with the disciples deal around. I always say there's two different ways to look at the hard truth. One, what is something that's hard to understand? And I don't think that this one particularly is that case, though for us today it is. I think they understood it in those days. But for us, because we're 2,000 years removed from this, because the cultural environment that they're dealing with was completely different from us and in many ways even at odds or complete opposition or complete opposites of what we experience here in our world today. And because it's in a, communicated in a language that we don't know, it's hard for us to understand sometimes. It's dealing with a religion, the religion of the Jews that most of us aren't very familiar with too. So it can be hard to understand. But it's interesting that the Greek word that John used for hard here is the Greek word skleros, which clearly does not mean that it's hard to understand. And you're probably saying, wait, wait, I know for a fact that I'm struggling with this. Well, the word skleros actually means that it is hard to tolerate. And what the point that John is trying to make by using that word is that not only did the Jews hear this message, but Jesus' own disciples heard it too. And because of the fact that they understood what it was saying, and they could not accept it and did not want to apply it to their lives, that it was hard for them to tolerate. And there are several things that are going on here that could be doing that among themselves, that be bringing this about. Uh, James Montgomery Boyce, in his five-volume commentary on John, talks about 
three reasons that he suggests for the crowd that the crowd found it hard to tolerate Jesus' message. I'm going to add a fourth in here. Some of these we've already talked about, but I think it's a really good summary of everything that's going on. And it's also a picture of what a lot of people struggle with when they're trying to come to faith with Jesus Christ. First is the incarnation. This passage of Scripture tells us that God, who is residing in heaven above for all eternity, has decided to take on human flesh and enter into history and experience the human condition in every way, just as man did. And the people here struggled with that, especially when Jesus saying that he was God that took on human flesh. They had trouble with that. I think the disciples grasped it that the others in the crowd were probably wrestling with it. Second of all is the gospel of election, which we just talked about. Many found it hard to accept that only those who are chosen and called and drawn to God by God can actually come to him. Okay? The Bible clearly teaches both election and predestination. Okay? We, I don't think anyone in here can put up a good argument for that. There are passages scattered throughout the Old Testament that's are, that are there. Anyone who is a serious scholar of the New Testament is going to have to find one way or another to deal with those passages. Maybe you want to change the way that you interpret it. Maybe you want to put up a fight against it. Maybe you want to ignore it. I don't know, but you have to do something with them, okay? And that's what this, this passage is teaching us, okay? My thought is, and I don't struggle with predestination and election because I look at it and I see everybody gets what they want. What's the problem? Jesus isn't forcing anything upon anything, on anyone, except he's drawing us into something that is much better than what we've experienced before. Here's what I'm talking about. Past three years, there's several of y'all that have joined me in this on a weekly basis. We have knocked on a lot of doors in Bartlesville. And on a regular basis, a lot of the people, if not most of the people that we talk to, show no indication that they are interested in what Jesus is offering to them through our discussion with them. For the most part, there are exceptions. And I also realize that this is a process, and maybe this is something that will initiate their journey towards Christ. But for the most part, they, aren't, they don't want Christ. They don't ask him into their heart, and they get what they want. They don't want Christ. But the problem is, is that people think with predestination that it necessarily involves a double predestination. And what I'm talking about that, not only are some people, Christians, called to salvation and belief in Christ, but there are also others that are called to damnation. That's not what I believe the Scripture teaches. First of all, Jesus and God don't have to do that. We are, we are preconditioned by our sin nature, nation, nature to pursue rebellion against God on our own. God doesn't have to make anyone do that. In Adam, we prove that we are all descendants of him. We all have his nature as being the product of his seed. We all are sinners. He doesn't have to make sinners out of any of us. We are all already damned to hell. He doesn't have to do anything. But in order to save a person who is damned to hell, he has to come in. The scripture says that they are dead in their trespasses and sin. It says that we are enslaved, that we are in bondage to it. And in order to come to Christ, we would have to be brought back to life, and we would have to break the bonds of sin that hold us back. And it's impossible for a dead guy to do that. So how does God do it? He sends his Holy Spirit into our life to regenerate us from within, to give us a new heart that changed, is a changed heart. It desires to follow after God. And if you're here today and you're thinking, yeah, I desire to follow after God, you may have never thought of this before, but the reason you desire to follow after God is because God created that desire within you. The Scripture said he draw, draws us to him. The word that... It, there's probably a better translation is that he compels us to do that. doesn't mean he forces it, but he presents a presentation of himself that is so compelling that we would not want to say no to it. That's what he does for us. What a great blessing. That's what he's trying to do. And we get so upset because we think that, well, so-and-so wasn't predestined by God. I don't think that's, that's fair. We don't know. God's the only one that knows whether they were predestined or not. All you can do is worry about yourself. What's the condition of your heart today? As Ezekiel says, has God entered into your heart and taken away your heart of stone and replaced it with the heart of flesh? 
If he has, he is drawing you to him. Celebrate, rejoice. You are going to be a child of king because the scripture promises that whoever he begins this process up, he will finish it to completion when we stand in his presence in glory. And the scripture says we will see him as he really is and we will be just like him. The greatest promise ever given to man. And we fight it. I understand for a lot of you it's going to be a process to come to this because you've been taught, or taught, been taught differently all along. I'm fine with that. I'm also, I also realize that me and maybe my explanation of this isn't perfect either. But I do know that these are concepts and principles that are taught in the Scripture. And this is the thing that the Jews and probably some of Jesus' disciples were struggling with too. So don't feel bad if you're struggling with it. They struggled with it too. But don't openly reject something that is clearly taught in the Scripture. Find some way to come to an understanding with the Holy Spirit's help where you can make peace with these texts and understand your salvation. Went longer on that than I meant to. Very quickly, the crucifixion was hard for them to accept. They couldn't believe that God would take on flesh and then he would allow people to nail him to the tree to be sacrificed like a criminal. And I think there's also, as he talks about coming into this relationship with God, being described as eating his flesh and drinking his blood. Okay? I think there were people there that struggled with that. Now, the ones that didn't understand are thinking, what is he talking about? That's like a cannibal, eating flesh and drinking blood. Okay? They didn't understand. Jesus is clear here that he's not talking about things of the flesh. He's talking about things of the spirit. Okay? That's the point that he's trying to make. He's talking about union and participation with Christ. And, and I don't know if you've thought about that. Bread is a food. It's a perfect illustration for this. When we consume bread, we take it, we chew it up, we swallow it. And it literally becomes one with this. Okay? We absorb the nutrients from it. We gain strength and vitality from it. We find the source of life in it. And by daily, continually consuming and consuming the food of life that God provides for us, we become strong physically in the very same way by continually eating his flesh and drinking his blood on a daily basis, we become strong spiritually. And what he's talking about is what Romans uh, 6 talks about. It says that if we are united with Christ in his, bapti in his crucifixion or his baptism, where we die with him, we're pictured just like we saw today, of dying to our old self and raising to the new. He says if we are united with him through the cross, through our baptism, then we also will be united with him through our resurrection. And that's the promise he's making, that if you will be willing to drink his blood and die to yourself, willing to daily go to the cross and put your sins to death, then ultimately you will also receive the life that he offers to us through his resurrection. So consuming the bread of life in a spiritual sense is very similar to doing it in a physical. It's like eating bread. We participate in the act that took his life. That's what they struggled with that it was our sins that forced him to the cross. We become a part of it. We're actively involved with the sacrifice itself. You know, in the, the book of Leviticus, it talks about the sacrifices where they consume it. In the very same way, they're actively doing it. They're consuming it. It's becoming part of them, and they're becoming part of us. It becomes part of us. We become part of it. We're one with us. We're there. We're united. It no longer... It is no longer separate from us, but we live and we move and we breathe together as one. That's what Christ wants us to do with him. We can't ignore it. Belief is no longer easy, but it comes as a price. Perfect example, the last thing I'm going to share, is the Passover in Exodus 12, when he talks about eating the flesh and, and drinking the blood as a sign of our spiritual blessing in Christ. You remember that the children of Israel were in bondage to Egypt, a series of plagues had come upon Egypt, and the very last one was a death angel that would pass over the nation and kill the firstborn of every family and of every animal. And the solution to this gives a picture of the solution to our sin problem as well. Exodus 12 tells us that they, just as we do, we kill a lamb without blemish. We participate in his death. He dies so that we don't have to die. We apply the blood from this sacrifice through the doorposts of our home so that when the death angel comes, it will pass over us. We consume the flesh of this spotless lamb that was sacrificed for us. 
We consume it with bread that has no lemon. And the result is that we, are lit, that we live and we are delivered. What a promise from Scripture. And that's the promise that is ours to us, that is offered to us through the bread of life. And Jesus is offering that to, to us today. First of all, if you have never made atonement for your sins, and what I mean, you've never gone to God and made right with Him, the separation and the destruction in your relationship that is caused by your sin against the Holy God, then you need to do so today. The bread of life makes that possible. Scripture says that if we believe in Him and trust that He'll forgive us our sins, that they will be. It's not an easy belief. It's one that literally, as this passage says, which the disciples are struggling with, involved giving everything to God, literally dying in a spiritual sense on a daily basis. And that's the offer that's here to you. And just a minute, we're going to have uh, Julie come up, and she's going to lead us in an uh, invitation song. While she's doing that, if you would like to come and talk to me or someone else about getting things right with Christ, we're here for you at that. You know, and I also know that there's everyone in here is probably struggling in some area of their life, uh, an area that they perhaps have not yielded to Christ, uh, that they have not received the satisfaction from the bread of life, the, the healing and the perfect uh, redemption that comes to us through Christ. I want to challenge you to do that today. And whether you do it at your seat or you come to the altar and pray, I invite you to do that as well. And I also want to invite you, we had the boxes for our prodigals on the right and the left. Uh, these are people that you love that are living far to God that need to hear the truth that's contained in this message. Uh, I invite you also to come forward and to pray for them today. So let's pray and enter into a time of invitation. May you hear clearly from the Lord what he wants you to do today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the wonderful truths that are portrayed in this passage. Father, a picture of how man can be freed from his sin and come into a relationship with the holy, uh, almighty God. And Father, we, we beg your forgiveness for the ways that we behave just like these three groups we talked about today. Coming to you in unbelief, coming to you arguing and bickering and debating meanings of things from the word of God instead of seeking truth. Father, uh, being in a position where like the Jews and the disciples are grumbling against the way your plan has unfolded because it's hard for us to tolerate. But Father, we praise you for the goodness of your plan as it's portrayed in Scripture. We ask that you would bless us, Lord, that you would bless this time of invitation, and that you would use it all for your glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.